this is a part of the conference I've really been looking forward to because uh, one of the, I, I would say one of the, the, the leading treatise, so to speak, on cyber is the Talon Manual. I, I guess we'll get some dispute about that from some quarters. And uh, a new version of it has literally just come out. And we are very fortunate uh, to have Colonel Gary Korn and, and my friend uh, Sean Watts here to talk about it. And they're going to give you a little bit of insight, I think, on how it came to be, um, what's in it, what's not in it, uh, and what the controversial areas around the margins may be. Without further ado, gentlemen. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, General Dunlap. Thank you for the, the time and for the invitation here, and thanks to Duke for their wonderful hospitality. I have to start with, um, with something of a confession. Earlier today, uh, I was snooping. I, I, looked over, I looked over at the notes uh, that the person I was sitting next to was taking. She was writing notes in her, her program, and I couldn't help but notice there was a hard line drawn just above uh, this session. And there was a text bubble at the end of the line that said, go home. And so, uh, so I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. I, I leaned over and I pointed at my name tag. <laughs> and without missing a beat, uh, this person scratches out, go home, and writes, get back to the office. <laughs> so um, those of you that are still here, uh, I, I admire your endurance. Uh, and I have to say, initially, uh, when I heard the reference to a uh, 100-year marathon, I thought is, maybe that's describing a lens conference agenda. Um, I don't know what Charlie takes, but I want some of it. Um, but uh, again, thank you, thank you, General Dunlap, for this time. Well, so um, Professor, or rather Colonel Korn and I uh, have agreed to, um, oh, I'm sorry. Well, that, yeah, that's us. Um, <laughs> and, and that's the book. We actually have some slides Not for you. Here. <laughs> we, uh, we agreed to do something uh, a little uh, unconventional as presentations go. We're going to sort of tag team this thing. Uh, I'll start out uh, with a general orientation uh, to the manual. I'll, I'll walk you through uh, initially the process, uh, how the thing was built, uh, what the, some of the people who contributed to it uh, look like and, and, and thought, um, a little bit of how maybe to navigate the thing, uh, some ideas of what it can do and, and what it very definitely should not do. Uh, for you. Uh, then Colonel Korn will offer some reflections, maybe put the thing in context. He'll, he'll, he uh, is very much um, personally and leads an office of the people who are the intended readers uh, of the manual, so he'll give some reflections there. And then we'll get you into the, the substance of the manual itself. We'll, we'll share a few of the rules with you. Uh, I'll brief those rules and then we'll, uh, we'll have a reaction to a few of those from, from Colonel Korn. Uh, so to begin, uh, the, the Talon manual actually starts uh, before with an earlier iteration. There was a, a Talon 1.0. We didn't know it was 1.0 because we didn't know there would be a 2.0. Um, but it was uh, initiated at the behest of an organization called the um, CCDCOE. This is the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. They are not a NATO organization, uh, but they do live in, uh, in Tallinn, Estonia, uh, and are supported by NATO. Uh, there are 20 uh, member states of NATO that support the CCDCOE. Uh, and back in 2009, uh, they invited a group of us uh, to convene and to write a manual, uh, a legal manual, on the laws of war applicable to cyber warfare. Uh, this process took us about three years, uh, four times a year, believe it or not. We would all convene there in Tallinn, Estonia, which, by the way, is a beautiful place uh, to go. If you ever get the chance to go there, uh, do not pass uh, that chance up. Um, at any rate, we would meet uh, there a, a couple times a year and, and tried to hammer out uh, these rules. And the product was the Talon Manual uh, 1.0. It's roughly 100 rules uh, focused on both the laws of war that govern the resort to force. So if you're a law nerd, this is the, the use ad bellum. Uh, but also the laws of war that govern the conduct of hostilities, what may be targeted, what may not, some of the rules about treatment of persons and so forth, the use in bellow. 
Uh, so this was the subject matter of Talon 1.0. It was uh, well received. Uh, Colonel Korn may have some comments on this, and I'll, I'll say I, I thought one of the better endorsements uh, I witnessed was when, uh, as an Army reservist, uh, assigned to the United States Strategic Command. Uh, before I had my clearance, of course, I, I wasn't able to go into the back rooms where, where the, the cyber operations are planned and where the legal reviews take place. Uh, before that, I, I, I worked for two solid weeks on Freedom of Information Act uh, requests. Uh, that was a great incentive for me to get going on my security clearance and get all of them and find the, find the home address of my old third grade teacher. Uh, uh, so I could stop doing FOIA requests. Uh, but once I was let in, it was pretty gratifying to see uh, dog-eared copies of Talon Manual 1.0 on most of the lawyers' desks uh, there at Strategic Command. So, so we, I, I had a feeling we had, we had at least in some respects accomplished the mission just by getting it uh, introduced to that environment. But of course, you know, a, a cyber manual that examines the law applicable to cyber warfare is only covering what? You know, maybe a fraction of a percent of what goes on in cyberspace. That is not long after uh, 1.0 is released, it's pretty clear to most of us that we've written a manual that only, only will apply to very rare cyber circumstances, that the vast majority of what's going on in cyberspace these days, indeed what's going on between states, isn't happening as cyber warfare, cannot legally be classified as cyber warfare. These are peacetime interactions between states. Now they are, in many cases, contentious to be sure. Uh, they are not all friendly uh, cyber interactions, but to call them war would be to misapply uh, the law. And so after, just immediately after 1.0 is published, uh, the CCD COE uh, invited uh, a few of us again to, to consider a, a further project, a, a Cyber Manual 2.0, if you will, or a Talon Manual 2.0, if you will. And the idea was to look at the rest of it, to say, okay, what does international law have to say about peacetime uh, cyber operations. Uh, that took us to an enormously broad uh, swath of public international law. We were no longer confined to the law of war. We were no longer confined to the use ad bellum and the use in bello. Uh, this was an enormous project and, and it took a further uh, three years. To give you an idea, uh, of how we went about this. The, the first thing we did was to change up the group of experts. So the, the Talon Manual was produced by about 18 or so uh, law of war uh, specialists. We realized early on that to do uh, this new manual, we needed new faces. We needed new uh, batches of expertise. Uh, and so we reconvened a different group. So uh, 2.0 reproduces the law of war, cyber warfare work of the 1.0 manual, but adds on top of that, really does double in size, uh, the first manual, adds a separate section uh, that is produced by a separate group of experts. Again, there are about, I think, I think there are 18 or 19 of us in the Talon 2.0 group, uh, but they are quite different in their expertise and, and outlooks. The second respect in which uh, the drafting group differed from 1.0 uh, is that it was uh, more diverse. Uh, there was criticism of the first manual that, look, that's interesting. It's nice to know what Europeans and North Americans think about the law of war, uh, but how much utility do you think your manual has in other places like Russia or India or China? Uh, we took that criticism uh, to heart, uh, and so you'll find if you page through the list of contributors to 2.0, uh, a much more geographically uh, diverse and culturally diverse diverse uh, set of contributors. Uh, I think that that made for an improvement uh, in the second manual. Uh, it was all done uh, pursuant to a Chatham House rule, so I'm, I'm not uh, at liberty to divulge any of the positions taken by any of the individual lawyers. But I can say this, that, that they, they surprised me. You know, I went in thinking, well, the Chinese guy is going to say this, or, or the Belarusian guy is going to say that, and they, they greatly surprised me. Uh, it really was a, a terrific learning experience for, for me uh, personally uh, in that respect. Uh, a second manner in which uh, 2.0 differs from 1.0 is the consultations uh, that were undertaken. So uh, the first manual was sent out to peer reviewers. I think there may be a dozen or so. The, the second manual included over 50 uh, academic, legal, operational, political uh, peer reviewers, one of whom uh, is, of course, uh, Colonel Gary Korn here. So we did broaden our consultations with uh, non-contributors. Uh, it also included an interesting process, this, this process we call the Hague process. The, the Royal Dutch government, uh, specifically their Ministry of Foreign Affairs, were kind enough to convene 
taking three sessions in The Hague, Netherlands, uh, and invited uh, over 50 ministries of, of foreign affairs and ministries of defense uh, to review drafts of the manual uh, and to give us confidential feedback uh, on, our, on our chapters. Uh, so that was also, uh, I think, an improvement uh, on the manual. We were better able to uh, become aware of the concerns of some of these government uh, agencies and to incorporate some, not all, uh, but some of uh, their suggestions to us into the manual. Uh, last thing I'll say about its organization is format. Uh, it'll look familiar. If, if you didn't know Talon 1.0, this is going to look very much like, uh, for the sea service guys, this will look like your San Remo manual on uh, law of naval warfare. Uh, Air Force folks, this will look like your air and missile warfare. Uh, manual. There are all sorts of predecessors uh, in terms of format to this manual. Uh, it is broken down into two main segments. There are what we call rules, uh, and then there is commentary to the rules. For a rule to become a rule, every single word of, of that black letter rule had to have the support of every member of the uh, drafting group. Any member of the group, any single member of the group, uh, could kill a rule or could kill any word uh, in any rule. There is unanimity uh, to every word that is uh, captured in a rule of the Talon Manual. There are, I believe, 156 now uh, of these rules in the new manual. Uh, those are interesting, and I, I suppose they're quite reliable if, if you put credence in the unanimous views of, of, of these, these contributors. Uh, but I, I find the more interesting sections the commentary. Uh, the commentary uh, is where we explain the rule. We show our work, so to speak. Uh, we uh, identify the sources that were persuasive to us. This is also uh, where we provide what I think should be helpful to practitioners, uh, some uh, hypothetical scenarios. Uh, there are laced throughout the manual scenarios, cyber scenarios that we tried to dream up. We weren't especially imaginative in 1.0. Everything was about a botnet, uh, which is sort of the limits of our imagination at the time. Uh, I think you'll find in, in 2.0 a richer uh, a richer collection of, of cyber scenarios uh, based on the help we got from some of our, our technical uh, assistants here. Uh, but the commentary are also interesting because this is where the group fragments. Uh, that is, although we had to agree unanimously on rules, uh, the comments are where we captured points of disagreement uh, within the group, and there were plenty. So you will find majority positions, you will find minority positions. Every once in a while, you'll find a position captured that says a few of the, a few members of the group. A few is code for one or two of us. It's usually generous, uh, and, and very often, I, I guess I can say this, uh, it's not violating the Chatham House rule if I said it. Uh, sometimes you can just put Watts after a few. I, I lost more legal arguments than I did as a criminal defense lawyer um, over in Tallinn. But at any rate, uh, we did try to capture uh, everyone's view there. There is finally in the commentary, you'll find sections that say, uh, the group acknowledged a view that. What this means is none of us thought this was the law, none of us held this view, but we know there are some crazy people out there that think this, and it's worth acknowledging. Uh, they, they aren't crazy, but uh, it is a way for us to capture views that none of us personally held, but maybe for awareness purposes, it would be useful for a lawyer to know that there are people, there are even in some cases states, uh, that think uh, X is the law. Um, so that's, that's sort of the process that produced it and, and a little, uh, some words about how to navigate the manual. Colonel Corn, do you want to take it from here? Yes. Thanks, Sean. Good afternoon. Um, so this has been a great day so far, um, and I've been taking feverish notes on a lot of things. I've learned some really important stuff. One was, fortunately for me, like an affirmation of a principle that has guided me throughout my career, which is I can make good decisions without being well informed. <laughs> so if that makes you nervous, sir, I'm, I'm sorry. But uh, I also learned that, that our delegates are at grave risk of harm in the uh, spin cycle of our, our washing machines. Um, that is kind of scary. Um, but uh, no, so some of you uh, have already heard me talk on some of these issues. Some of these, my remarks will be familiar. And I also put up, I attended the launch um, event for the town manual uh, a week or so ago in, in DC, and I put up a post on just security on, on some of my initial thoughts. Um, this, without an impermissible endorsement uh, or anything like that, yeah, I mean, I have my copy. I had my copy of Talon 1. 
I do not go by Ivanka. Um, right? This is a, a great tool for me, and I will I would imagine you know anybody else who's going to practice in this area, and frankly, anybody who practices in international law, because it is actually a very good compendium of a lot of black letter international law um, that isn't just applicable to cyber. Um, and in fact, that's sort of the interesting aspect of it. Th this is extant law. Um, it's, it's well put together, well thought out, but it is the beginning, in my view, of a process of trying to um, in interpret and, you know, Howard Cole used to say translate, I would say adapt the existing law to this incredibly unique environment and space that is evolving, this thing called cyberspace. Uh, so, you know, I want to talk about that a little bit as a stage setter, kind of how I see this environment and some of the challenges that, that I face every day as a practitioner and as someone who has to give legal advice um, at senior levels of, of how we address uh, these problems from the, the Department of Defense's perspective and, and more broadly feeding into national policy level decisions about how we address these things. So, um, I mean, it is obviously, we've, we've seen a flavor of this throughout the day, an incredibly complex um, environment, right? We, we call it a domain in the military, like the air, space, um, land, and sea, uh, to, to operate in and through, but with incredible complexities. Starting with, um, there's just a number of cross-cutting sort of overarching policy interests in this space. Um, on the one hand, it is our national policy, and, and rightfully so, that we have a free and open internet. And that is something we view as, as fundamental to us, um, not just internally but globally, both for the, the sharing of information, the development of, of, of information and new ideas and innovation, uh, the backbone of commerce. We all know this. I mean, raise your hands, who's not connected in the room probably right now to the internet, right, and, and on a constant basis. Um, at the same time, and we'll get to this, there's this notion of uh, jurisdiction within the geograph geography of your own territory and the authority and the need to, to regulate um, your cyber infrastructure and the activities of, of people within your sphere of jurisdiction and what they're doing uh, on the internet and in cyberspace. Um, and there's a tension in that to some degree because there are states who want to take that position to an extreme uh, for purposes of censorship, for example. Um, so how do you balance those out? Um, becomes very complex and so developing some of your broader policies. And you know, as I mentioned, the internet of things. There was some mention this morning about recent, uh, the, the, the Dyne, DDoS attack, that leverage, you could be sitting here right now and not realize that your, your iPhone or your Android is actually part of a broad botnet that is being used to, to conduct malicious activities, a, a denial of service attack um, on some portion of the internet and that, that is having uh, negative impacts, right? And I won't ask for a show of hands because I won't uh, pull on private information, but you know, I'm sure if we all travel, your phones travel outside of the United States with you at times. My point being that whether it's a, a, a mobile device or the internet at itself, it doesn't necessarily respect or comport with traditional notions of geography, which are which is the, the foundational framework um, that we've developed a lot of the rules in international law that we're familiar with. And, and so there's tension there. How do you adapt some of these rules um, to that non-geographic concept of cyberspace and the internet. Um, I would say too that um, we've also learned today that the nature of this, like there were phrases like you cannot build a wall high enough, and I know that John Carlin was referring to um, metaphorically in cyber, he wasn't talking about other walls, um, right, or you can't uh, there's no silver bullet, kind of in discussion about you can't defend your way out of the challenges in cyberspace. You can't protect your way against 
all the threats in cyberspace. And in fact, what we have is a sort of an offense dominant environment. The technologies are getting easier and more diffuse. You can get them on the dark web. You can get them other places. Um, sometimes the techniques are elegantly simple. Somebody mentioned today, if you leave your password lying around, you have just given someone, if they find that, total access to every account that you have that's got that password, right? Um, those credentials. They can take that over, they can lock you out, they can take your information. That's not a particularly um, hard thing to do. If you have the username and password, you just log on and do it, right? Um, so we're in what I would say, and the, and the primary actors were identified today in terms of, from a state perspective, Russia, uh, North Korea, China, Iran, and we certainly know um, ISIS and, and other terrorist organizations are leveraging this environment um, to advance their interests um, and, and conduct operations that we would see as adversarial or, or harmful. Um, in a very offense dominant environment. And so we are in this state, and this is what Talon was really trying to address. Uh, the, the questions come constantly. I see them coming from, um, from Congress and from other areas. We get them in the command all the time. What is an armed attack in cyberspace? What is an act of war in cyberspace? This is not an insignificant question, but at some levels, that's not really where the game is. We're seeing this constant level of confrontation, um, which is really challenging a lot of core notions of um, how do we deal with this from a deterrence perspective? How do we engage in this environment to protect our interests? And, and how does the current state of law fit um, that both serves the purpose of its core purpose in international law of, of international uh, stability and peace and security, but also allowing states to protect themselves? And, and this is a really challenging piece. So what we wanted to do was kind of walk through some of these areas substantively, um, and I think we should, probably should have mentioned the questions, we don't need to wait till the end. If you got questions, pepper, pepper away. We kind of like to keep this as an open dialogue now going through these, these different substantive rules uh, as we walk through this. Um, so we'll start with, we, we kind of talked about doing one in bellow, right, uh, rule to talk about some of the challenges there and then springboard to some of these other questions. So here is the, the table of contents for the, the new manual. Uh, as you can see, it's an extraordinary broad swath of public international law. The, the coverage from 1.0 is there at the bottom. Of course, it was restricted to the laws of war. Uh, and this took us, uh, this, this new project took us all over public international law. Uh, Please don't ask me anything about international telecommunications law. Uh, I will, you guys can keep a secret. We just all kind of believe the guy that wrote that one. That, that's, that's a tough area of the law. The, the, um, at, at any rate, and we relied heavily on uh, consultations and, and peer reviewers for that chapter. But at any rate, uh, you can see the extraordinarily broad uh, collection uh, of law that we're, we're dealing with here uh, in the manual. Uh, as Colonel Korn said, we wanted to take you back to a 1.0 uh, issue first, though. So uh, this is a rule that, that comes from the, the first version of the Tallinn Manual. It is a rule about uh, the law of war threshold of attack. Uh, let me clarify from the outset. This is not the use ad bellum, the United Nations Charter version of attack. That is, this is not armed attack that gives rise to the right of self-defense under the United Nations Charter. No, this is a use in bellow, a conduct of hostility hostilities notion of attack. If you've spent any time with the law of war, you know that it is obsessed with and laced with these thresholds of application. That is, a good lawyer doesn't just pour into the law of war to find answers. As she first asks a number of threshold questions to ensure that she really should be looking at the law of war at all. 
The most important, of course, is, is she in a circumstance of war? Uh, the term the law, the law prefers is, is this an armed conflict? And so there are rules, uh, of course, that govern the, co the conduct of hostilities, but we only resort to those rules when we've satisfied ourselves that we are in a situation of armed conflict. Well, within those rules, especially the rules on the conduct of hostilities, which you might call targeting law, there is a further, and what I think is an underappreciated threshold, that is the threshold of attack. Although targeting law offers a lot of intricate and helpful and frankly humane rules about the use of force and the conduct of hostilities, a lawyer really ought to only resort to those rules, rules like proportionality and precautions in the attack and minimizing collateral damage and, and so forth. She should only resort to those rules when she satisfied herself that the operations she's analyzing is in fact an attack. Uh, and so we took this, this rule or this precept, this threshold, uh, and, and tried to figure out what it means in a cyber uh, context. So the law uh, that we used uh, is Additional Protocol 1, Article 49, and the definition is there for you at the top of the slide. Now, if you're an American lawyer, if you're an American military lawyer, I've just made you nervous because I took you into Additional Protocol 1 uh, from 1977, and you know the United States is not a party, and you know a number of other militarily significant states are not parties to that treaty, but Article 49's definition of attack is widely accepted as custom. The United States is on record as having supported this as an accurate legal definition uh, of what does constitute an attack. Uh, so we took additional protocol one and tried to cyberize the thing a bit, uh, and you'll find this in Rule 30 of the Talon Manual. Um, so we say the focus here was really on effects. That is to understand what counts as an attack, whether a cyber operation is going to be fully subject to the laws of targeting, we would ask about and be interested in the effects that we expect from that attack. Uh, that was a point of consensus uh, among the group. Talon 2.0, I would say in 98% of the, the rules, merely reproduces uh, what we said about the law of war in 1.0. We did get the band back together, so to speak, that old group uh, of international uh, law experts, and we did update 1.0 slightly. And if you'd ask me before the updates whether there were going to be any, be any changes uh, to what we had said, I would have bet you that we were going to change a little bit of our understanding of the notion of attack. Talon 1.0 pretty clearly reflected a majority view that a cyber operation that merely destroys data, deletes or alters data, is not an attack. For the majority of the group of experts, such an operation didn't produce the effects, the destruction, the damage, the injury, or the death that is normally associated with an attack. So a cyber operation that would only delete data could not rise to the level of an attack in the view of the majority. I was in the minority in this view and fought really hard. I, I, I really thought this viewpoint undervalued data. Colonel Korn and I were having the discussion over the phone, and, and we'd both heard people say this. You know, look, at this point, I would rather someone stole my car than my laptop. Uh, the, the data are profoundly important to us. The discussion on the, the panel two previous uh, to, to, to this session, I think illustrated well that the integrity of data is, is so important to us that a rule of attack that doesn't, doesn't, or a rule of attack that doesn't include operations against the data cannot last long. Uh, I was wrong. Uh, we took a vote again, and, and, and the, the positions held. The majority of the group still could not conceive of these operations. Um, against data as constituting an attack. Now, uh, we did have, we did have um, majority and minority points on, on other issues. The question of functionality came up. Now, sometimes a deletion of data can be more than a deletion of data, right? The data may have uh, knock-on consequences. Now, if a destruction of data does produce death or injury, for instance, we're thinking of medical records, that came up, and I think it may even be an example in the book, uh, the majority then thought, yes, that's an attack, but it was not enough to say that data were simply destroyed to call it an attack. Uh, similarly, there was a view that, look, an operation that doesn't destroy the computer, but rather hinders its functionality may in some circumstances be an attack, but again, the group split. The majority view was 
It is only an attack if the operation against the cyber infrastructure requires reinstallation of a component. That is, if we have to take a component out of the machine and replace it with another, okay, that's going to be an attack in the majority's view. Uh, others, uh, the, another issue that split us was the question of software. Well, what if you have to reinstall software? Again, uh, that split the group. We could not come up with a consensus there. So I'll say my, my colleagues surprised me. I, I really thought uh, that we were going to see an evolution uh, on this. I thought there was maybe even state support for this, uh, but the majority weren't quite there. Yeah, so um, I, I would say that as with a lot of what we see in Talon, the, the, the facts, the, ch the hard facts of these operations, these, this domain, I think is gonna put intense pressure on the law to e adapt and evolve, right? I think we're at a good starting point. I'm not, I don't consider myself in the camp. Some are out there. I think their voices are, are, are dwindling, but who would say that this is such a unique domain that none of its ex existing law applies and we need to come up with a new Geneva Convention for cyber or so on and so forth. No, I think um, the core principles are there for us um, and the rules give us the right guidance, but sometimes it's hard in the application. Um, so the data question is, is definitely one that I think will have to evolve. And I think we do sort of, the analysis undervalued it to some degree. Um, but you, you also get into this challenging question, as I said, you know, if, if what you're doing, um, and, and obviously I'm, I'm limited by classification, I'm limited in, in not being able to discuss operations, um, but the Secretary of Defense has made it clear that we are bringing cyber to the broader fight against uh, ISIS and, and Al Qaeda, right? So um, most of these operations will not cross that threshold um, even in that margin of discussion about what would constitute an attack under traditional law of war targeting analysis. Now, does that bring you to a point where you say you're, you're then not constrained at all? Uh, civilian infrastructure, civilian data is fair game. Um, I, you know, that's, that's an area that's not clear. My personal view is no, we still have baseline principles, um, if nothing other than military necessity and concepts in the Martins Clause and others, and some would argue the, the constant care provisions um, in Protocol 1 um, still impose some, some requirement on you to consider uh, the impact that you might be having on civilians or civilian infrastructure. And I think that's probably right and certainly a way we, we approach the analysis. Um, but you can see that's an area that's sort of unclear uh, in, in these operations. Um, the other point here, and it's springboard, is if you think about how the internet works, um, hyperdynamic, uh, multiple data centers globally, domain names, uh, where data is resident, can actually be shifted and moved around globally very quickly. And organizations like terrorist organizations, their infrastructure, the, the things they own, use, or co-opt um, in cyberspace are not limited to a geographic area of hostilities. And so while they may be operating in a certain area and you're trying to say disrupt their communications in their, their particular combat operations or their planning to conduct attacks more broadly, uh, they may have data resident in a variety of different places globally. And so you can't just limit your analysis uh, to the in bello rules. You have to start working through the harder questions of the, the, the other areas of international law that we're gonna touch on now to think about what, what your options are in those operations. And that is also true then of nation state actors um, and considerations of this, this confrontation that we're in and what each state's options are to deal with these, these threats in the cyber domain. Um, I think we have our first question there in the back. I know that uh, Talon 1, since you brought up AP1, Talon 1 went out, uh, 
went out of the way to talk about how it's a non-binding agreement, but it also talked about how it's a writing of the experts. Do you go to the same level in Talent 2 to talk about whether it's binding or not on international law or whether you're intending it to be a representation of customary international law? We sure do. So each of the, the rules, the black letter rules, is offered up uh, not uh, as a an expression of treaty law. Uh, to make the cut for a black letter rule, uh, it had to be, in our estimation, customary in nature, binding on all states. Now, I think there are two or three rules uh, where we thought we had identified a, an important enough treaty norm uh, that we wanted to capture it, but each of those rules immediately clarifies that it is only a treaty rule uh, for parties, states party to that treaty. I, I could not tell you off the top of my head which those rules are, um, but yes, in 99% of the case, we were trying to give a snapshot of what we thought was customary international law. For the non-lawyers in the order, audience, this would be uh, a variant of international law uh, that is binding on all states uh, and is, is, although in some very limited circumstances, uh, can be accepted out of, for the most part, uh, binds all states. And it is based on a formula of, of state practice. That is, it takes account of what states are really doing and then takes account of the fact that states are doing that thing or engaged in that practice because they think they have an international legal obligation to do so. So yes, thank you for the the clarification, Talon 2.0, like 1.0, is a snapshot of customary uh, international law. Yeah, I mean, I, I would qualify that slightly. Um, it is the considered opinion of the group of lawyers um, about what customary international law is. That does not necessarily equate to it being customary international law, right? And fair enough, this is a matter um, and, and Mike was very clear in, in his post and in his launch that ultimately uh, what international law is is a function of states um, and customary international law is a matter of state practice and opinio juris um, as expressed by states. But we know this is a challenging area more broadly that um, a lot of times states aren't as vocal as we would hope they would be about opinio juris and then lawyers like us start doing are you know come, conjure, coming up with our views of what we think customary international law is, sort of like the ICRC study did, and there was certain pushback on a lot of things. So again, that's why I say this is a, a phenomenal starting point, but a starting point. So let's move to next. Okay, so so now we're into new rules. These are rules uh, that are um, that are featured in the the second version of the manual. If you are if you were looking for the thesis statement of probably both 1.0 and 2.0, uh, it would be this, that international law applies to states' actions in cyberspace. Now, that's not earth shattering, it would seem, but uh, it is enormously important. Um, Colonel Korn mentioned earlier, you know, the, the debate is cyberspace are really so different that we need an entirely different rule set. There were, to be honest, in the very early uh, years of, of, of academic and even professional argument about uh, international law and cyberspace, there were theories that were quite exceptionalist in nature, theories that said, look, uh, international law cannot apply and does not apply to cyberspace. Uh, even some states clung to this view uh, relatively late. Uh, the United Nations Group of Government Experts uh, process was mentioned by one of the earlier panels. This is an attempt to get states together to say something uh, about international law and cyberspace. They were relatively late to come to this conclusion, or at least to do so on paper. But finally in 2013, and again in 2015, uh, this group of states all agreed, yes, uh, as a starting point, international law applies to cyber. The fact that you are doing something in this virtual world or this world that some people conceive of as being virtual, you know, the more I learn technically about cyberspace, the less and less virtual it, it seems to me. It's actually quite a real thing. It is nodes, it's people, it's, it's equipment and hardware and satellites that actually exist, and therefore the logic of applying international law to it is, is quite compelling. But in 2013 and in 2014, we get this, this concession from states, this fairly clear message that yes, 
uh, the regular rules of the game of international relations do apply uh, to cyberspace. So the first conclusion we draw uh, from that in the new manual is a rule about sovereignty. And really, to fully understand what we're saying about sovereignty, I, I think you, know, you need to understand uh, two aspects of our treatment uh, of sovereignty. Uh, the first is, I would say, positive in character, the second is negative in character. The positive statement of the rule uh, is captured for you there on the first bullet of the Talon 2.0 rule, and that is that sovereignty applies to cyberspace. What this means for a state is a state can exert its authority over the infrastructure and the people that are operating in cyberspace. That is, if they exercise jurisdiction in traditional formats, most especially on their own territory, they can exercise jurisdiction, be it adjudicative, prescriptive, or enforcement jurisdiction. They can exert that uh, against uh, cyber means and through cyber means as well. The more controversial, I, I think, statement, and this is rule four uh, of the new manual, uh, is the rule that is more negative in character. That is, the group concluded that as a matter of customary international law, or that in customary international law supported the notion that states may not violate sovereignty. Now, I have to say, Early on, we didn't see this as an especially controversial rule. Sovereignty is fundamental to international law. It is the baseline of so many rules of international law uh, that we thought it unexceptionable, unexceptional that states are required to respect the sovereignty of one another, that as a general matter, a state may not intrude into the territory of another state and supplant its authority. A state may not, without the consent of another territorial state, conduct operations on that state's territory. And so our logic was that it is an internationally wrongful act for one state to violate another state's uh, territory or its sovereignty. Uh, it was not difficult to achieve con uh, consensus on all of those points. A few of the comments uh, that might be worth pointing out uh, are that a connection to cyberspace is not a waiver of sovereignty. The fact that you have allowed the world to send traffic uh, over cyber infrastructure that is locate on your located on your territory is not a message to the world that you have waived sovereignty, that you've opened the doors now for them to enter uh, and, and to exceed the permission uh, that you've given them to, to use your networks or to transit traffic there. Uh, the second important point is this is only a rule for states. As a technical matter of law, although non-state actors are significant um, forces to be dealt with in cyberspace, non-state actors cannot violate sovereignty. That is, they don't have the legal personality to violate another state's sovereignty. It would be inaccurate to say that a hacking group violated a state's sovereignty. This was a point on which uh, we had consensus as well. Uh, and then finally, we looked for a clear example of what we meant uh, by internationally wrongful conduct resulting from violations of sovereignty. We split when we tried to put a little more detail on this point. That is, when we tried to imagine what an unlawful violation of sovereignty looked like, the group began to fragment. We achieved consensus when a, a cyber act supplanted an inherently governmental function. That is, when another state supplanted a target state's ability to perform the functions of sovereignty, especially those related to authority and administering its territory, that was for every member of the group of experts a violation of sovereignty and therefore an internationally wrongful act. You can see on the right-hand side of the slide, however, that we began to fragment after that. That is, as you got away from interference or usurpation of inherently governmental functions, fewer and fewer of the experts were willing to concede uh, that a violation of sovereignty had occurred. The subject that split us most greatly uh, was the question of remote cyber operations. So these are cyber operations where you don't have a physical presence in the, ter in the, in the target state. Uh, you are using electronic means, uh, you are using networked communications to achieve some sort of effect in cyber infrastructure located in another territorial state. Uh, we really could achieve no consensus and ultimately you'll find in the manual our characterization on remote access operations as violations of sovereignty is that the law is unsettled. And we, are, well, we decided this is an area where we just need to await uh, the sort of clarifications from states, the developments in the law by states who are the only authors of international law uh, before we gave an answer to that. These are, of course, the points Colonel Korn was making. So here's, um, th this is a foundationally important point in the overall sort of 
manual and the, and the, the architecture of international law with respect to cyberspace. And it's um, a point of departure where, while there's much of the manual that I, I would agree with, I, I personally don't agree with the manual's approach to this question of sovereignty. Uh, this is not to diminish the importance of sovereignty. It is a fundamental and foundational principle of the international order ever since Westphalia, at least. Uh, but the real question, the heart of it is, certainly with respect to what you describe as the negative aspect of the rule, which would be a prescription on states' interactions uh, on the international plane amongst themselves, is whether or not just a, for example, the, the remote uh, cyber operation that you describe would be a violation of international law. Uh, a breach of an international obligation by that sort of cyber trespass, as some would describe it. Um, so you, you can either approach this as sovereignty being a general principle upon which states uh, have, through their sovereign equality, have come together to make international law when they have deemed it to, to be in their mutual interest to do so. That's sort of the core foundation of international lawmaking. It is, it is the province of states, um, and they either do it through treaty, or we understand the customary international law development process. So here is a point where the manual would suggest that it is a customary, binding customary international norm um, that can be violated. That's significant for a number of reasons. Uh, if a state is going to take an action in the territory of another state on the infrastructure of another state, if that is a violation of international law, there has to be a justification in international law to do that under the, the construct of the principles of state responsibility. Um, otherwise, it's a matter subject to uh, diplomatic interaction. It may be considered unfriendly, it may uh, be considered something that is can be dealt with through what we call retortions, which are not unlawful acts. We heard some description of those this morning when we were talking about sanctions. There are other me measures you could take that would not be considered unlawful, but would counter um, certain adversarial actions. But, but this is a, a sort of critical question to understand the broader architecture, because a lot of the other rules sort of build themselves off of this base question. And depending on which way you, you come out on this, there are a lot of gaps and seams, I would argue, um, in that structure that can, can and are being exploited um, in this environment. So uh, this principle, principle versus rule, for example, if you look at Article 2.4 in the Charter, that is a clear instance where states, in the protection of the concept of sovereignty and based on this principle, made law, All right? That's not in dispute. So we know that the use of force against the political independence or territorial integrity of another state is unlawful unless you have a justification or consent or Security Council authorization. Um, we'll see if we get to it, but there's a customary national law principle recognized in the draft articles. Um, of the principle of non-intervention, which is a threshold below the use of force, but they are still measures that are considered unlawful if they uh, coercively or dictatorially uh, impact the exercise of core functions of another state in its sovereign authority within its, within its territory, the domain reserve of a state, right? Core functions like the selection of your, your political process, uh, the selection of your cultural um, system in your, in your state, those things, and, and there was some allusion to that this morning, uh, when you talk about matters like Sony or the DNC, you start to get into discussions whether they meet the elements of that. But that's certainly an area where states have, through customary international law, said, here is a rule that, that prescribes our behavior and activity inter se amongst us. The question remains whether there's something below that that impacts this. And I think that there is not the state practice or opinio juris, certainly with respect to this cyber domain, to conclude that there is a rule of international law um, that, that prescribes 
activity below those established thresholds. The, uh, one of the issues that, that we sorted through when we developed this sovereignty rule was the, the question of espionage. Uh, espionage came up frequently. Uh, there is a, a rule on espionage, and, and, the, and the, the position the manual takes is that espionage is not itself an unlawful act. Uh, that is, carrying out intelligence gathering or information gathering operations in another state uh, does not violate international law. Uh, then you ask, well, wait, how do you have this sovereignty rule that says violating another state's territorial integrity is a violation of the law? It, we split a bit on this question, uh, though the reasoning was slightly different. Uh, for some, the conclusion that espionage doesn't violate uh, international law was simply an observation to this effect, that you cannot show up to uh, an international tribunal. You could not, if you were a state, go to the International Court of Justice and complain, state a cause of action of espionage. That, that's just not codified in, in treaty law, nor is it an aspect of customary international law. However, the constitutive acts of espionage can be unlawful. That is, a state that kills the citizen of another state while information gathering has committed an internationally wrongful act. They have not committed the internationally wrongful act of espionage. They have committed the internationally wrongful act of probably a use of force. Uh, that is, the fact that you're doing espionage doesn't give you a free pass on the rest of international law. There is recorded uh, in the commentary on the espionage rule, and I think we've got it here in sovereignty uh, as well, a, a differing view, a, a view that apprehends espionage as something more in the nature of an affirmative defense. Uh, that is, a state can say, because it did a thing in the name of espionage, it has somehow legally shielded itself from international responsibility for those acts. Now, now that was a minority view. Um, and very few, I, I think this is one of these where it was, we were generous to call it a few, uh, but it was a view that was offered, and, and I think it does nest importantly into, into sovereignty here. Right, and, and the, the manual's position on espionage is that it is an exception, right? A carve out from the base rule of not violating sovereignty, that sovereignty is an international rule, because you have to account for it. Um, I, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't agree with carve out. I, I, I think the majority view is simply, uh, it's not, a state cannot complain of the offense of espionage. It cannot lodge that complaint against another state. It, it can make a diplomatic complaint, of course. It can make a political complaint about espionage, even an economic complaint about espionage. But international law just never heard of uh, the internationally wrongful act of espionage but that espionage can be comprised of lots of individually wrongful acts. That is, the majority view is that it is not a carve-out or a shield for a state to say it was done in the name of espionage. Um, that seems to say, you know, and, and, and I think it's a, it's a great memo. I'm not complaining it was done the day before the inauguration, but... Or just before the release of the Tallinn Manual. <laughs> right, exactly. So, but it seems to say that, that, you know, uh, looking at espionage principles, we can go in and we can try to track things down. And then it also then says um, that if you're going after international terrorist organizations, that you can even have de minimis effects, right? So what would the Tallinn Manual say about that? As you're, as you're hunting down the, you know, mapping out the, the network? Uh, I, we, we did become aware of that memo, uh, and it was curiously timed just before the release uh, of the manual. In fact, I got it um, in, in my other life as a reservist at, at United States Strategic Command. They sent me this uh, just a few days before. So, so they got guidance from the Department of Defense Office of General Counsel saying, basically don't read any of that stuff the Tal Emanuel is saying on sovereignty, read what, what, what we think about it. So there is, this is very definitely an area of contention. And I'd say this is an area where, where I, I think some of my co-authors have already conceded we're going to see changes uh, in the law. If when we were drafting this, we couldn't point to any strong state expression that said it's okay to violate other, other states' sovereignty, it's not an internationally wrongful act, it's 
frowned upon maybe, but it happens so frequently in some con context that it can't be wrongful. Uh, I, we weren't fully aware of that view at the time, and if there's a 3.0, would it look different in light of that memo? Absolutely, and it would have to account for that memo uh, absolutely as well, I think, yes. Um, yes, Mr. Lucas. Uh, uh, your deliberations in the area of space. A colleague and I were talking about that this morning, and we weren't sure whether 2.0 took that up. I see it's in the table of contents. Uh, that seems to me a, a vexed area, to say the least, and uh, understudied compared to some of the other uh, um, um, jurisdictions that we may have, have, have debated about. So uh, could you share with us some of your reflections there? I would agree that it is the final frontier. But <laughs> uh, sure, uh, we had a, a couple of preeminent uh, space law experts, uh, both on the group uh, and in, in consultation with us. Uh, this was a, a chapter that uh, changed more than any other. I, uh, although I've done a little work now at uh, Strategic Command uh, on space law questions. I was not aware uh, of how violently split that community is on, on so many issues. If I were to characterize the, the space law chapter, I would say first it is grounded heavily in, in treaty law. There is an important treaty uh, that, that governs that area and we found, I, I think there are very few points on which that treaty doesn't reflect customary international law or we found very little evidence uh, that it did not. Um, the, but boy, it is a, if I were to characterize it generally, I would say it is another of these chapters where you're going to find the more important work done in the comments. I, I doubt if you know a lot of space law, you'll be too impressed with what made the cut for a rule. It had to be so watered down uh, that it didn't probably say anything especially important. However, the commentary is pretty rich uh, in that section and I, and I hope helpful. It's, al it's already uh, being put through its paces. I, I know at Strategic Command that, that particular chapter is, yes. Yes, sir. What are the rights of a state that is attacked as an act of war? What what rights does that state have? Well, so the first question is, um, how do you categorize, since we're talking about cyber, a particular action that is taken by one state or, or a uh, non-state actor group against another state? If, and, and that, that is addressed in talent, I think there's more general agreement there between what you can see in the DOD Law of War Manual, for example, and the approach you take to assessing effectively if you would consider this the, the type of damage that is caused by this cyber operation um, equivalent to what could be caused in a kinetic realm, then it's probably going to be treated the same way, and the same rights that a state would have would be triggered. And it's not limited to a cyber response. I think that's a critical question. So if, if a state conducts an operation through cyber that, for example, um, the, the example was used today about a, a dam. If they cause that dam to open and flood and cause significant damage and, and harm to people and, and, and death, I think any state would assess that and say, we consider this to have been an act of war, an armed attack on, on us, and we have the right to respond in self-defense. And if that means launching bombers to go after the, uh, the, the cyber command of that other state or other, other uh, legitimate targets in warfare, that's, that's a legitimate response. Absolutely not. Um, if you're saying that espionage is not an exception, I think is your position to the sovereignty, um, but they could not complain of it. And I mean, I'm looking at the, you know, the consensus opinion here and the majority. What's the content of this rule? Because if, if what we're saying here is the state has sovereignty over its cyberspace, which, as you said, is really there it doesn't exist. It's physical things. It's people and nodes and hardware inside of its country, which I don't think anyone disagrees they have control over. 
It, you mean to say it does exist, right? It is I, I agree. Stuff. It exists. Yeah. There, I mean, yeah. cyberspace is a thing. It's not something different. It is the hardware and the electrons and the people and the nodes. And it generally resides on somebody's territory. I agree. Yeah. So if the content of this rule, because those things exist on the physical territory, is that mere intrusion, right, which is, looks like that no consensus part, mere intrusion would be a violation of their sovereignty, then it would seem to me that any espionage, all of the espionage we have ever done, would be state practice to the contrary of this rule. If it's not that, I have a hard time understanding what the content of this sovereignty rule is. Uh, I mean, except for maybe remotely launched damage, but that seems like you're getting very close to the armed attack standard, and we're back to Talon 1.0 type questions, which I don't think there's a tremendous amount of disagreement about. If you're open yeah, what he said. <laughs> all that. No, I, I think you're... You're spot on with the concern, um, and, and again, we'll, we'll talk afterwards. I'm Whether it was in something that Mike put out or actually in the chapter itself, I think it does, in, in the espionage piece, account for it as an exception to the general rule based on longstanding state practice. <laughs> but you have to account for it one way or the other as espionage. So it's either an exception, but uh, again, I don't think that, that state the, the evidence of state practice um, supports that analysis. Um, and, and I just want to emphasize by an example, why does this sort of matter when you think about the non-state actor uh, example? If you are violating international law, if a state is going to violate international law right through an operation, as I mentioned, you have to have a justification. Um, you can consider it a countermeasure if what's being done to you is considered a violation of international law. You can respond with a countermeasure, which is a sub-use of force action that would otherwise be unlawful. Here's an exception to that, though, is that that particular rule of international law only applies against states. It doesn't apply against non-state actors. So the non-state actors are using infrastructure in the territory of a third-party state to attack you um, and you are restricted from being able to go in and take measures uh, to stop that attack from happening because under, their, under the talent manual approach, by doing so without the consent of that third party state, which may in many cases be impractical, uh, you, you would be committing a violation against that state. Uh, th that somewhere something's got to give. And so that's, you know, in essence, my bottom line point is this is where some of these pressures to adapt uh, the, this body, these bodies of law, to, to take account for the, the particularities of cyberspace, uh, has to happen. Gentlemen, thank you very much. This really is the cutting edge. <clears throat> this really is the. We'll have, you can park in the law school parking lot, <clears throat> which is, there's where you are, or there, there's where we are now, and if you come down Science Drive from where you parked before, you'll actually want to go down Tower View.